Join me in welcoming and honoring an extreme activist in the service of Jesus Christ, Dennis Peacock. can't help it. <clears throat> well, that was a creative introduction, Hugh. Well, bless you this morning. I need grace. <laughs> Come out of uh, five days of very intense meetings, which this wonderful house has hosted. Thank you, Terry, and your elders, and Rana, and all of you who served. Uh, you had people from all over this nation who really are doing stuff, and uh, we came together with God rolling. Thank you. It was helpful. Well, my dear, loved, beloved friend and his wife, Poor Gerald Chester puts up with me as the Luddite of technology. <laughs> that means somebody that doesn't really believe in technology. Dudley, I, I, I learned a fellowship with my great-grandfathers when technology showed up on the web. I understand why they said, you know what, the horse's carriage ain't going to work. I'm not going to get involved in this thing. <laughs> I seriously thought that. I said, look, I don't want to get into the computers and all this stuff. I, I can wait it out. But it's proved, <laughs> it proved I, that dang thing's tougher than me. I can't wait it out. <laughs> and uh, so I did my first, yes, that's right. Don't worry about it. Please don't let it distract you. Don't bother me. Um, I did the first PowerPoint that I've ever done and asked poor Gerald to help me do it. Now that wasn't design cruelty, but I think Gerald probably has lost a sometimes tenuous grip on reality anyway by me asking him to do something like that. So I'm having fun this morning, which means I'm trying to get the engine started. But thank you again, Terry, so much for what you guys have done. How many of you are glad the Lord had mercy on us with Terry? Thank you. Now, I warned you. I can't tell you what I said to him, but I called him and warned him on the phone that don't, don't do what you're going to do here. But thank God. Well, in these meetings, uh, we've been wrestling with the challenge of uh, how do we as God's people respond to a situation where the, those two who are, two in particular, are vying for the leadership of a superpower, like two 12-year-old children, poorly trained 12-year-old children. To those of us that have been around a while, seriously, uh, as a one, you know, who graduated studying political theory and all this stuff, you, you are just jaw-dropping. It can't be possible that this nation has ended up where we are right now. Now, it is possible and we need to understand that the church needs to take its responsibility. Dudley and I are hunting the same animal, going different ways at it. But the question is, how do we take the gospel, how do we take who we are and manifest that in reality? Okay. Scripture is wonderful. The question is, how do I live it? And I want to talk this morning a little bit first about the prophetic context in which we are. Uh, this is going to mean more to some of you than others, depending on where you are. It's always that way. 
But I know there's a bunch of you in here who in a very self-conscious way wants your life to count. Your Christianity is not just about you. It's not about going to heaven. Uh, it's not about those things. It's a question of how does Jesus manifest himself through my life? And what is the context in which the day that I'm living in needs Christ to be manifested? Do you hear what I just said? To discern the times and align our lives with the task that Jesus has given to those of us who are alive at this time. When we do get home, it's going to be interesting to talk to those who've lived throughout history. And from their point of view, at that place, they'll be clear as to what Jesus wanted to accomplish in their generation. Now, those of you that are younger in the Lord, that kind of thinking maybe has not hit you yet. But as you mature in Christ you will begin to think more about, okay, I'm secure in the reality of the cross and the blood and the resurrection and the scriptures. Now, how do you want to use all that in my life to bring change and to, in our case, bring answers to tons of people? And I appreciated what you said about fear. And people are wise to be afraid you if you're not afraid when you've got two principal people calling each other names to manage the world's biggest superpower you don't understand what's going on this is a very very dangerous time and yet at the same time enormous opportunity part of what we are trying to get the leaders to all get on one page that we're here because a bunch of people that were here affect stuff on the highest levels. Is do you see that the walls of the world system are crumbling? They no longer have the authenticity to say they know how to manage the planet. And as those walls come down, it creates what we'd say in football an open field for 90-yard plays. Hear me now in the Spirit. In my lifetime, I have seen the arrogance of the world system assure all people that it had everything under control and that they, they knew how to manage us. And if we would just get out of the way which is what they've tried to do to Christianity in the church, is get us out of the way. If we just get out of the way with our antiquated values and our antiquated morality and our judgmentalism and all the stuff they accuse us, if we can just get you people out of the way, we'll have a clear running field. But God's taken the wheels off their trip. My wife, who will be here the second service, gave a debate in 1964, was engaged in a debate around the question, should the federal government be involved in education? Do you hear what I just said? That was a debate in 1964. And once the federal government got involved in public education, we now have the fruit of a dumbed-down civilization going down, 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 with the primary goal rolling. As long as we feel good about ourselves, that's now the goal of education. doesn't matter if you know squat, but if you feel good about yourself, that is what they've given us. So the question is, how do we, by the grace of God and some diligence, how do we create a sieve, a colander, 
through which we live our lives and assess reality day by day through this sieve of the scriptures. Every single day we have the opportunity of interpreting one event after another. We're measuring what is going on inside of our minds. We're measuring what is going on with us emotionally. We are constantly processing reality, whatever that is to us, on an internal level, and we're responding to all this stuff that is happening to us all day long. Now, here's the challenge. How do we get the gospel of Jesus Christ and the principles of the kingdom of God deep enough in us that as we are internally processing our reality and externally processing what we're experiencing, it's being interpreted through the sieve of God's life. All you ladies who, and some of you men who love to cook, I wish I could cook. I love to eat. <laughs> you get that pasta and you put it in the sieve and, and you see the water coming out. Think of that as an analogy of letting the Word of God be the sieve through all this internal and external processing. We're interpreting reality as much as we're able to all day long through the sieve of the gospel. Are you with me? That, my friend, is what I would call spiritual maturity, the journey to spiritual maturity. (laughs) Maternity, yeah, right, birth too. (laughs) I just fell into John 3.16 and didn't know it. (laughs) But that is that sieve of reality. Now, I am afflicted, as Hugh so insidiously accused me. I am afflicted with caring about what happens to people on large scales. I care, and there are others in here that do. Not that you all don't, but for me it's a calling. I care about Nations. I care about discipling nations. I care about the United States. My mother, whose parents uh, and actually grandparents came west in covered wagons and lived through all that kind of reality, she reminded me that we've inherited slavery exempted, which is the great stain stepping around for a moment the great stain. We inherited the sacrifices of people whose lives were tough. People who lived lives that were really living in the, in the sieve of the gospel and died in their early 40s. Uh, didn't have, I just had a, cataract removed from my right eye. As I told Dudley, I said, I've found one thing now that's a benefit of aging physically. Because when they take out that cataract, they give you a new eye. And, and I'm seeing things I've never seen before. Some of you have been praying that I would see things I'd never seen before. <laughs> so dang, this is really cool. I get eyes of a little kid because the colors, I haven't seen these colors since I was young. So keep praying. I get the other eye done here in a couple of weeks, and I may end up not blind. Who knows? So in this meetings, and I'm measuring myself here, I was talking about where we are now is what I'm calling the third nexus. And uh, do, you, do you want to do this? We'll do it real quick. 
uh, put the, go ahead, next page. A prophetic view. We were here to talk about the true state of the union. Am I in the right place? Do you understand what they want you to think the state of the union is, isn't? I could tell you stories. You don't want to know what I know. Um, where did disciple nations, and there's key verses. I was going to get into Psalm 2. How many of you remember enough of Psalm 2 to know that it, it is God calling out the kings and rulers of the earth saying, you're trying to manage my planet. I just want you to know I've installed a king. His name is Jesus. The world is his. The kingdom is his. And if you think you're going to triumph over me, you've been smoking stuff you shouldn't smoke. That's my interpretation of Psalm 2. The Lord laughs and has them in derision. As for me, I've installed my king. And all your armies and all your universities and all the rest of your trip is not going to stand. How many of you sides me believe that? So next, next in Romans 8, 17 to 22, I'm sure Terry and Dudley and others on the stage have, have talked about that. Do you know what your eternal destiny is? It's not to fly around with wings and bore each other forever with our testimonies. <laughs> I want to hear your testimony, but please not forever. Okay? But Paul talks about our destiny is to manage the creation of God with Christ. Now, that may not sound too exciting because you haven't enough trouble managing your own life. I understand. But as we grow in Christ, our calling is our Father wants to share his creation with us and this one's going to hurt you, but deal with it. And give us more and more responsibility for stewarding his stuff. See, we got a major disconnect right there. Because most people think the gospel means Jesus delivered you from ever having to make major decisions again. All you got to do is shuffle up to Jesus, report for duty, and say, what do I do next? Am I in the right place? Yeah. Now, in the beginning, we all start off with that, because he's trying to break us, convince us that we're idiots, which shouldn't take much convincing, really. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You don't know you're an idiot, your neighbor does. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we go through the I'm an idiot stage, and then you begin something. I remember the first time I asked God, what do you want me to do here? And he said, what do you want to do? I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. How did the devil get in my prayer? Do you understand what I just said? I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm asking you for direction. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's called begin to grow up. Because the goal is to get my mind in you deep enough that I can, I, that you will let, that I will let you make choices once they're aligned with my life and principles because I'm not into creating robots. Hello, do you know what we just said there? So as we get de-robotized, and don't jump the gun, because some of you need to stay robotic. <laughs> Are you with me? As we begin to grow in the Spirit, and the mind of Christ, the Holy Spirit, is got a hold of us and the sieve is interpreting reality and Roland, my dear brother, in helping me to interpret my own nonsense biblically. 
I'm then moving into where God wants to be creative through my personality. God does not want to destroy your soul. He wants to mature your soul so that his creativity can work through your personality. He ain't into robots. Religion produces robots. Jesus is not into robots. So now, next one. Next slide. A nexus is an intersection where two things come together. Next slide. I'm going through this. I'm going to go ahead, go, go through that. Here's the first nexus. The church is ascending. Secularism in the fall of the Roman Empire is descending. The X, the interchange happens at Constantine's conversion. They both fall off, both fall off the train in terms of managing the planet according to God's ideas. The early church had no idea it was called to manage the planet. That would be another discussion. How many of you know you read enough history? You, it's clear the early church had no idea that it was called to manage the planet. It was looking for Jesus to come back tomorrow. So when Constantine gets converted and now the political apparatus is given to the church, it is not in any way prepared to manage the planet. That being the case, we go into the dark ages. Nexus number one. Next, next one. Nexus number two, 800 AD, uh, Charlemagne coronated there Christmas Day, year 800. Again, now the fusion of, of the secular world and the church make another try at it. The Holy Roman Empire is born. And that goes on. A lot of gyrations and what have you, all the way up into the 1600s, 1700s. Then what we call modernity begins to arise. And you get that nexus where the church and secularism come together. And as science and philosophy and renaissance and the humanism, some of you all studied that stuff. Whether you studied it or not, it's real and got us where we are. Okay? The church, through bad theology, gets chased off the playing field and says, go ahead, secular science. Go ahead, secular ideology. Go ahead. We started Harvard as a school of theology, but now it's a humanistic, secular university. And the church goes along with it, by and large, and says, okay, here's the deal. You guys manage the planet, and we'll take heaven. You want to know how we got to Hillary and Donald doing what they're doing? I just told you. It's 300 years. The momentum of a catastrophic decision by the church. Turning over God's planet, which it didn't have the right to do, and saying, you guys manage it. We'll take heaven. And besides that, it's too much work. How many of you don't want to be an airhead for Jesus? It's too much work. I can't manage my own life. Why in the world would I want to be involved in trying to manage other people? And the simple answer is because it's about love. Our theology put us in a love crisis. The reason the world doesn't pay any attention enough is they get we don't love them. Then we got rapture theology shows up, don't mean to hurt your feelings, but it comes off to the world like, okay, I get what you guys are saying. The quicker you fly, the quicker we fry. And you want to talk about love? I don't think so. 
How many of you know God is not excited about judging people? We get excited about it. He is not excited about it. Third nexus, which is what this conference was about. Somewhere in the last 20 years, this is not a magic number. God did not say 2,000. But somewhere here in the last decade or two, the wheels have come off the truck. I've never seen the United States of America unsure of itself. I'm 73 years old. I have been paying attention. I've never seen the United States where it is right now. We could do anything. That's what made us unique as a nation. We had faith and confidence and power. And, eh, not, not, not so much. Not so much. Some of us who deal with the fiscal gap and are aware of what's going on, the real debt, which is more like 200 trillion, you don't want to go there. Of obligations that we've committed ourselves to based on the demographics and projected tax shortfall, we're about $200 trillion in debt. I heard with my own ears Philadelphia Fed guys there saying, we've never been here, we don't know what to do. Newspapers right there never said a word. New York Times, all of them. They don't want you to know. We don't know what to do. But something, a sound began to move. I could preach if I had the energy here. A sound began to emerge globally called the kingdom of God. Riding on Pentecostalism and the charismatic renewal. The renewal of the currency of the Holy Ghost showing up to a church that wasn't sure the Holy Spirit was still really alive. He got a hundred years plus of momentum. And then the fivefold gifts of the Holy of, of Christ began to be talked about. Apostles and prophets living today. My friends, without apostles and prophets, we'll never go where we need to go. We could talk about that at some length. And the message of the kingdom begins to grow. You guys here have suffered through us preaching on the kingdom for years. In the early days, we had our meetings in phone booths. But now all over the world, by the hundreds of thousands, millions, leaders. Now, we're still in a lot of confusion because it's early days. That's always the way it is. But the kingdom of God, the reality of seek first the kingdom, thy kingdom come. Christ came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's beginning to permeate leaders all over the world. And as the message of the kingdom begins to get out, which is the application of the sieve to not only what you drink and don't smoke and sleep with and all the rest of the personalized dimensions of living in the sieve is now beginning to be applied to economics, applied to political order, applied to immigration. Now, Satan, that's the one thing he does not want to see happen. He's playing a stalemate game with God. He knows he can't defeat God straight up, but he don't have to defeat God straight up. All he has to do is play, play him to a stalemate where God can't get his people to be what God declared they would be and do what he declared they do. As long as we don't do that, the stalemate game is still on. Do you hear what I just said? You, I had to be here at this point in history. I had to be here. I'd have been mad at God eternally if I'd missed this game. 
I'm this old football player that got hungry to be on the field in games that matter. Anybody else in here, my brother, I see you. The greatest thing in life is to play for Jesus in a game that matters. That's, that's as good as it gets. Yeah. Invitation is, hey, guys, ladies, let's play. Let's play. Let's get serious and play. So now, we're in the third nexus in history. That's a context of where we are right now. Now, one thing I know about context and and Jesus in this game is I don't want to run against the wind. I want to run with the wind. And running with the wind means you're running with what God is doing. That's why context matters. Now, last slide. I got to park this thing. The 10 10 key issues, 10 master principles. A bunch of us, and that would be me for sure, I've spent 40, 50 years trying to decide what are the most important principles translated into fish because we're fishing for men and the men don't speak Bible, they speak fish, which is a whole other level of spiritual maturity. We got to translate religious language into fish is what are these major principles that are all multi-jurisdictional, which means transcendence and self-government and service-based power and nuclear family and blah, 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 and the bridge of trust. All of, of those ideas totally matter for me as an individually, totally matter for me as a member of family, totally matter to me as a member of the church, totally matter for me in the realm of business and economics, and totally matter for me in the realm of civil government. They are universally applicable. And behind those 10 things is a ton of Bible verses, which we're not going to pull out and play until they ask, where do you get this stuff? Then you got 10 key issues, shattered political parties, emergence of new managers. How many of you know there's going to be a pile of false Christ in the political realm emerge here not very far off? This thing is on the skids bad enough, you're going to see a whole change of new leadership next 10 years. Economic debt, financial restructuring, trade wars, and blah, blah, blah. 10 things. Rich, poor, disequilibrium. The animosity between the super rich and the poor and what created that. And how many of you know that problem is only solved biblically? But you can't solve these problems without the biblical sieve. Amen? Amen. So here the question. How do sojourn get in the game? How do you play both games? The gospel changing your life? your family, and the big game. How do you extrapolate those principles so that when you get in the voting booth, you're not voting like a Republican or a Democrat, you're voting like a citizen of the kingdom of God. So that is, that's where we are. Register to vote. If you don't vote, you're violating responsibility. Urge everybody you know to vote. Crisis is opportunity. I hope you don't hear me hopeless. I'm just worn out. (laughs) 
But friends, the walls of the world system are crumbling. They can no longer stand in arrogance. The emperor has no clothes. If you can see that in the spirit, the holes in the walls where God's kingdom is going to begin to penetrate through people, through groups of people, through Christians, the game is changing. Ask God, how does he want you involved in the changing of the game? Amen.